Welcome to Top Lines and Tales, your weekly livestock podcast. And as always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Harborough, with their continued support for this program. Welcome to another episode of Top Lines and Tales, your weekly livestock podcast. And this week I've got with me a, a sheep shearer, a, a farmer as well, and a YouTube blogger, and I'd call an internet sensation all round uh, good guy, Cammy Wilson. Cammy, welcome to the podcast. Uh, very kind of you, and that was quite an introduction there. Uh, you were you're a bit spot on. To you went to the all round good guy, but <laughs> <laughs> well, most people uh, will be no. used. To, most people will be used to seeing you on on uh, on the TV there, on the screen anyway there with the cameras. But uh, I run a podcast because I'm not as good looking as you, Cammy. So uh, I've got a face made for radio there. So uh, we're we're, we're uh, we, you don't need to get your your shirt and tie on today for and brush your hair for this episode. You certainly have a way with words, that's for sure, from from what I've been hearing, uh, listening to you, you, you've got a way with words, and questions as well, which is interesting, so we'll see how we go here. Well, we find a few questions, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of digging on you, Cammy, but uh, like a lot of other people, I do listen in to, 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 to a lot of your shows and uh, and, and really enjoy them. And, um, let's just start at the beginning, really, Wait, where's home, where are you based these days? Right now, I am now based at... Uh, in our, our rented farmhouse at Springside, which is just outside Kilmarnock. Okay. Uh, I believe it's, not, not it's a great claim to fame for it maybe, but I believe it's the birthplace of Nicola Sturgeon. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But <laughs> she's would, certainly would, somewhere about North I can edit that one out if you want to, Cammy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that, that is, uh, that's, a, that's a neutral statement. I'm just saying that I believe that's, uh, that's she, what Springside is famous for, that she, and being she, quite rough. She's not born in your house, you're not saying, no, no, just, just in the neighbourhood. No. <laughs> No, no, not in here, I don't think. Okay, but you're from Ayrshire, aren't you, originally, and uh, a farming background, I think, uh, Cammy? Yes, uh, my father was a shepherd, so I've uh, I've worked, basically worked with sheep all my, all my days, as, as farmers and shepherds' sons do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, from a very early age, we were out working with the sheep, and quite fortunate that where most of my sheep are now is, is the same farm that my father used to work on, so, um, okay. yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's stayed, a good setup. Stayed local, and then... I don't know whether it was voices in your head or something. Just to, one day you decided to be a policeman. Was that right? What happened there? Yeah, so it, it was that kind of old thing. I suppose I was probably the tail end of the generation. I certainly think I was the tail end of the generation where you're maybe even pushed away from farming a bit. Certainly, my situation it was it was a no brainer really because my father was just just a shepherd. If I, if I use that phrase, he only had you know he was just working for the farmer. So there's no farm for me to walk into um, or take over. You know, really, well, not even a position there really to work. So either I go away and work on other farms or I get my own job. And he he did a fairly hard life, like a a lot, of, very much like an old fashioned shepherd. You know, done a lot of. Uh, a lot of walking, a lot of hard work in his day, and you know he did a lot of aches and pains, and worked a lot of hours, and very little pension probably ahead of him. He never made it that far, right enough, which uh, so he didn't need to worry about the pension. But he was always pushing me, you know, find yourself a good job, you know, you get time off, you make good money, and you you get a good pension, um, and try and do things like that. He was always very much. You don't really want to begin into this kind of line of work. Something we all we all encourage our kids: they don't get into this work. Good, make enough money you can farm. You can farm for a bit of fun, but it's. Uh, that, but uh, hey, you can take the, the man out the farm, but you can't take the farmer out the man, can you? And uh, obviously, it's stuck with you. Yeah, oh, a hundred percent. It's it's just one of those. You know, don't get me wrong; not everyone's the same. But for me, growing up, I, I was it was very much the stereotypical situation. That and it, to be fair, it's not something I talk about much on any platform. But I, it was a very much a stereotypical situation of where, you know, my dad was my hero. I was out whenever I was out working him. That was like the best times. You know, uh, I just loved everything working with him, working with sheep. Thought you know he knew everything, um, and and just great experiences and great memories. And there's definitely a bit of nostalgia. The the whole thing with me getting sheep. So I was in the police supposed to just cut right to it. I was in the police at 18, straight out of school. Um, again, uh, I quite often, I play the, the poor shepherd son card quite a lot uh, when when I'm speaking at things and that, and I always use a reference that, that we were so poor that at Christmas time, my mum used to cut a hole in my pocket just to give me something to play with. <laughs> but, but best best present I ever got, though. I've had a hole in my pocket ever since. The secret policeman's so, ball. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. So I, I, I use that one quite a lot. But yeah, so... Very much a case of if I was going to, I had a, a offer, a conditional offer for Harriet Watt to go and do actuarial maths. It was maybe actuarial maths and statistics, to be an actuary, basically. Okay. 
Um, and I went to the open day and I spoke to somebody and he was telling me about his student loans and his debts and the cost of staying in Edinburgh and that when he finished his six years, the only real places to get jobs in Scotland were either in Edinburgh or you moved down south. And I was like, mm, nah, I thought that was for me, but maybe not. And at that time, the SNP had came in and they were all, you know, we, your country needs you. We're get, we need a thousand new police officers. And the advertisement was everywhere. And I literally, I just seen it one day. It says, oh, that might do. And stuck an application in before I know it was in the police. So fast fast forward to, that was when I was 18. Fast forward to I'm 25. And um, somewhere in between there, I'd learned to shear sheep uh, uh, and start making a sort of extra pound at that and maybe getting more networking within the sort of farming world off the back of that. And at 25, my father died suddenly with cancer. It was one of these kind of, you've got you've two months to go type thing. Oh, um, and, and they were pretty accurate. So he was 59. The, these these things happen. I'm always very positive about it in terms of the fact that, you know, I, I think I'm luckier than everybody else because I had uh, I had 25 years with that guy, whereas n- nobody else had 25 years with him. Like, so I always put, you know, that's the way I look at it. Like, I'm, I'm luckier than everyone else because I had that time. Um, so... It was definitely a sort of grief thing at the time. Uh, you know, when I look back on it, you know, struggling to sleep and just having a bad time of it. And I thought, well, I'm not going to work with sheep now because my dad's not about. Like, how do we remedy that? Well, let's buy some. So I went to Stirling and I bought four. Well, this was a terrible mistake. Uh, I bought four te- pure Texel gimmers. Oh, yeah. so, so I, I, I learned my lesson quick with that uh, that to. Uh, that job, but bought them, stuck in the garden, and uh, from there it's just spiraled okay. crazily. Yeah, I mean, crazy, crazy it is. I mean, we'll talk about the figures where you've got to just now, but I mean that's that's a great story that you turn positivity out of out of what is an adversity, and that's you know, that's a great story for a lot of other people. And again, I know you do the same as I do. We try and do a bit for the farmers and mental health and all those sort of things. But to know you've had that grounding in there, just uh, it does a, l- a little bit of a kudos to it. And you said you went uh, shearing, and I think you did competition shearing as well as some demonstrations and things when you first got started, didn't you? Get, you, know, you were not just shearing, but you were you were giving it a good go. Oh yeah, like for me, I've always been very competitive. I played rugby. I, I used to do a bit of rowing. I did a bit of the old CrossFit stuff at the gym, and it, it, just anything, a bit of running, anything competitive. I, I loved it. And when I first got into the shearing, I went out my first day. You, you maybe know. I, I, I should do a wee shout out here because I got a text and I sent it to you. I got a text uh, chastising me a bit for for letting you down the other day from John Andrew. Yeah. Um, uh, I the the Charlie breed at Rounson, so I shout out to John there. He'll love that. So <laughs> um, yeah, I started. I, I did a course with John, and I said to him, "Listen, if there's work going, um, if you pass my number. I knew his brother James was still fairly busy with it at that point. I says, we pass your number on to James. And lo and behold, little did I know at that time that James was usually desperate for an extra shearer. I thought when he phoned me, I was getting a lucky break. I was like, I can't believe it. He's actually phoned. <laughs> uh, but actually, he was just uh, desperate for someone. So um, I went for the, the, the hardest days of my life, certainly. I always say that. And I, I do always say to folk, if you, come th- if you can come through learning to shear sheep and come out the other side and still love it, then most other things you come up against in life will be easier than that. So it's, it's a good uh, it's a good thing to have behind you. Just whenever you're having a dark day or things are bad, just think back to those uh, sandy hill blackies and uh, th- 20 odd degree heat and they're kicking the life out of you and the guy next to you is doing three sheep to your one. Just think back to those days. <laughs> You still do. We'll go on to it. You still share at the moment. We'll go on to that in a second. But we'll probably come on to what people know you for, which is uh, Cam is the name and Sheep's the game, the Sheep game, and uh, a YouTube channel. And I've got to ask, how the fuck did that start? I mean, you know, <laughs> where did you suddenly? What suddenly made you think that people are going to want to see sheep on television? It's just like who wants to see a sheep on the TV? And on you end. Oh, totally. I, I, I was very unique on YouTube. I was very lucky on YouTube. It's such a saturated um, platform. With, with everything, you know, like there's probably a million fitness uh, vloggers and, you know, a million travel vloggers on there. But strangely, at the time, there was only really, there was a, a girl in Canada called Sandy Brock, who who's, who's massive, who did sheep, but in a very more sort of intensive uh, system. There was nobody really doing sheep farming. Just mm-hmm. like, there's loads of dairy, loads of tra- big track, fancy tractors, but nobody really doing sheep farming. And I used to have a lot of crack on the Snapchat uh, as 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 young youngsters do, mm-hmm. uh, and what I found great about the Snapchat and just talking about mental health and that, I, I, the crazy thing is, despite it being a big part of, of my income now, uh, I actually find social media, mainly Facebook and Instagram, very negative things. Mm-hmm. 
because people just post all the good stuff. So, you know, Christmas time especially is the worst. Like, you know, it's a, what folk don't realise. And I, I, it was it wasn't until I was in the police really that I realised this that actually for most people Christmas is an extremely depressing time. Or off the back of things like losing loved ones or whatever, it all just gets hammered home at Christmas time. So we used to have our most most suicides and deaths. You know, if we were working day shift on Christmas Day, because I, I was CID towards the end, you began to two or three suicides uh, when you come in in the morning, um, and that was your Christmas Day every year. And, and so it really hit home for me how how negative a time Christmas was and how negative social media can be because it piles on these folk when they're having a hard time and they see all this fake stuff like, you know, the person away in their fancy holiday to Barbados, it looks amazing, white. how can they afford that? But what they don't realise is the £8,000 that's on a credit card to make it work that, that then gets three years to get paid off. So I found Snapchat was great because you put all the disasters on Snapchat. Yeah, so so okay, you, you go out, that, you know, yeah. your, your belt <laughs> uh, your text top's lying on its back, dude. <laughs> You'd put it on Snapchat and send it to the boys and go, great start. To, how's your day going? And, and you know, you'd open these Snapchats and go, that makes, it's, not, it's not right, but you'd open and go, oh, well, that makes me feel better about this. Like, he's having a worse day than me. <laughs> and, and you'd almost make each other feel better by how bad your day was. Um, and like things you'd never you'd never put on Facebook or Instagram. That's, that's very true, and, isn't and it? And I, I never really consider, I have considered the fact how negative from, um, uh, certainly Facebook I use a lot of because you're right and also in, in, in these channels that you only associate with people who think the same way as you so I mean it becomes the whole social media is becoming a, a, a division isn't it really where I mean it's, it's sort of us against them and it's a, the vegan argument but if anybody becomes you know, goes on your on your chat and says something about you know, you're vegan you just like shut them off so everybody's t- t- preaching to the converted all the time so I understand that but I hadn't really thought about the fact that we only put stuff yeah I must admit I don't go on there and go shit my, my dog's died today <laughs> well maybe you do but yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear what you're yeah. saying there. Uh, no, I don't mind. There's plenty of people going it for a rant, right enough. But uh, no, I just find like scrolling through, it's all, it's all the cream that people put on it, and and you don't see everything else that's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and and if you saturate yourself with going through that stuff, it, it can weigh you down if you're if you're having maybe some some issues anyway. But with the Snapchat, as I say, it was great crack, and I used to always when things were going wrong, I'd always finish it with going, "That's a sheep game for you," <laughs> uh, and and. One day, somebody says to me, "You should go on YouTube." There's this young lad, Tom Pemberton, who's who's making a fortune off YouTube. Uh, you should go and have a look at him. So I'd never heard him at that time. I, fl- I put a video up, and it was uh, mucking out calf pens. And I'm sitting watching this video, and, and I'm about seven minutes in, and I I, I don't like cows. I've, I'm not really interested in cows. I mean, I appreciate you know a bit of beef, but I'm, I'm not interested in working with cows or that. Okay. And I'm about seven or eight minutes into this video of this boy mucking out calf pens, and it just sort of dawns on me like. What am I watching here? I'm like this, like I, like I'm almost kind of hooked in this, like just his personality and the way he did it. I'm like, I'm sitting watching a guy muck out dairy calf pens here. <laughs> it's like, what, what is happening here? And I thought, you know, this guy's good. It's like if I could, if I could have a go at something like that, but do it for sheep, I wonder if it would be as popular. And yeah, we just we we grab my mobile phone with my buzz cut. If anybody's um, wants a laugh, you could go back to my first video on on YouTube and I. I wandered around very much like this, and I said, "These are my sheep I've here." Seen and it. I've seen it. I watched it yesterday. Die. It's like you <laughs> trying to go through the gate carrying a bag of sheep feed. You're on the third go because you can see the bloody feed it all fell out the bag. And I'm thinking, how did you get from that's there it. to here? <laughs> Aye, that's it exactly. So, uh, and and the number one rule for for YouTube and, and these social media, like if I get asked a lot, you know, about starting out some advice, the number one rule is just get started. Yeah. Just pick up the phone, yeah. make a video, post it. Nobody will watch it. Because to, you know, when you first get started on YouTube, nobody's watching. You know, it, it took me, it took me fourteen months to get a thousand subscribers. Right. Okay. Um, whereas you know, a lot of people now are building up followings on Facebook and TikTok and these things, and they're just jumping to a thousand really fast. But it took fourteen months of, of grinding to get that first thousand. And that, that is how I mean. I know as, as, as an author as well. I mean, as well as my podcast, I write books, and I've written forty-five books now. And sometimes you write a book, Some and man. you spent a year writing it, thinking it's fantastic. And your first two months, you look, and it's like sold twenty-seven copies. You think, well, what is the point? You know, and it's quite hard to keep yourself motivated. And it must have been the same then for you. Then when you think at some stage, you could think, well, is anybody going to actually watch these things? Oh, oh, totally, totally. And that is why so many people fall away. Mm. You, you know, there's 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 very few people, there's loads of people who will start it, start a channel, start making videos, and then they'll fall away from it because, well, the amount of hours you need to put into editing to make your videos kind of half-polished for, for, for no return back initially 
but you do have to go. You've got to think about the, the long term um, opportunities that's there. I was going to mention. And you've got to, you've got to enjoy it as well, of course. And, and that comes over if you're not enjoy. Even when you're writing a book, if you don't enjoy, if you enjoy writing it, somebody will enjoy yeah. reading it. I always have that philosophy. But I mean, the editing you mentioned, we'll maybe go on to that in a second because obviously I edit the, the, the podcast down, but it's a lot easier. Editing video is, is hard work. I've done some of it, but let's just go on to to what you have achieved and and uh, YouTube uh, channel now. I believe two hundred and sixty seven thousand subscribers. Is that right? Yeah, that's. I'm a. It's. It does sound. It does sounds amazing. It is. Um, and, uh, it is. And I'm. I'm, very, I'm yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, the, do you know the only thing I'll caveat it with? And I'm very realistic about this. Is that YouTube has. I'm not gonna say sold its soul a little bit, but it has. It's. It's went down the route of TikTok. Now, like TikTok, it's easy to get a million followers on TikTok. Are fairly easy. Like it, it's not such a an amazing achievement, but to do. Or let's say a hundred thousand, for example, on TikTok, really easy. But to do it on YouTube used to be a graft. You know, it used to be real hard work. But now YouTube do the short sixty-second videos the same as TikTok. So I was shearing one day at a farm in the borders, and I handed my phone to the the farmer's uh, uh, good wife who was helping with the bull. And it was the last sheep of the day. We'd done three hundred odd that day or whatever, and I was pulling out my last one. I said, "Can you just film this sheep for me?" And it was just a, it was a tick mop blackie uh, on a shooting estate. Took the wool off it. No more wrong, it? It was, they were nice sheer sheep. That's why I took the video, uh, you know, 59, 58 seconds or whatever. So it fitted perfect in that mm-hmm. thing. So no editing. I just said, sheep 339 for the day. Uh, oh, no, the title was, it was a sexier title than that. I said, uh, gone in 60 seconds. I think I, I titled it. And I stuck it on YouTube Shorts. And it's done something like 105 million views. And... Of my two hundred and sixty odd thousand subscribers, about a hundred and fifty thousand of them are off that video. Really? So, okay. so it's really kind of skewed the figures. I'm probably near a hundred thousand true subscribers, and th- this other batch are just wanting to see short shearing videos. Okay. If you know what I mean? Yeah, I was going to go on to that. I mean, obviously, I run a run a podcast. We've got forty minutes, and you know, for folks to to doze off. I mean, sometimes people say the forty minutes keeps them entertained while they're going around the sheep or driving a tractor or driving somewhere. And other people, well, I think forty minutes is kind of a maximum um, span. For yeah, I can hear I can hear Di Clark snoring in the background already. We've only got the ten. We've only got the ten, <laughs> ten minutes. I saw you had die on. I've not got to that one yet. I saw you had die in, in uh, we James Nisbet as well. He messaged me actually right. here on a podcast with Andy. Yeah. So, so going back to so that, that the short, very short videos. Then, yes, you're right. People will watch. A lot of people will watch that because it doesn't take much of their time. Whereas, if you watch something for more than three or four minutes, it generally is something that you're interested in, isn't it? Uh, but uh, yeah. let, let's just go back to the sheep share in a second, uh, Cami. There, you said you, know, you shared a sheep there in sixty seconds, and you made like a. I mean, you're an expert. Did you? I think I saw you shared five hundred sheep in a day, or close to, or something. I mean, I don't know what the world record is, but you're 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 an expert, expert shearer. Oh. Which I, 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 I'm sure, uh, I think I've done 470 odd in a day, I've never actually uh, done a 500 okay. yet, we, we might get it this year, mm-hmm. but um, no, it's, it's. I think the record's 700, 700 odd, that's uh, different, diff, <laughs> aye, different gravy, that uh, Big, <laughs> Matt, Big Matt Smith down there uh-huh. uh, in Devon, but uh, no, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm very pleased, this, this has been amazing, Sheeran is, you know, if folk were to ask me what's your goals for next year, like, the first thing that comes into my head is Sheeran. Mm, okay. You know, and like, I want to make that Scotland team at some point. Okay, okay, that's, uh, that, I that's think, a th- good ambition. The uh, championships coming up next yeah. year, is it? It's, it's this year, yeah. yeah so you know, we've got. A, you know, I've, I'm. I shouldn't really say it, I don't want to jinx it, but I'm fairly confident that Scotland's going to have a world champion uh, by the by the end of this year. Okay. And you know, we ha- Scottish shearing. So this will be my first year moving up into the Open. Uh, won the senior circuit last year. We're now into the Open grade, which is the top grade of shearing. Um, for for the UK, well, around the world, New Zealand's the same kind of system, and so now we're up with the big boys. It's a massive jump because you go from being in a, a pool of guys that have never won the senior circuit, so they've never won that circuit. You're all in the kind of even playing field. To now I jump into a pool where I'll go to the Highland Show and be up against ten guys that could all be in and about that World Championship final. Okay, you know there'll, there'll, be, there'll be fifty in the whole thing, but te- you know probably be ten of them that are like world class. So you're you're now jumping up from. You know, sharing with the boys to, and and with like world class giants. Yeah. You know, like your Hamish Mitchell's, uh, Callum Shaw, Gavin Much, Matt Smith, Roland Smith. These monsters, big Ivan Scott. These absolute monsters of the sheer world. And you're just, it's quite a unique thing with sharing though. Like you know, 
you could turn up at these shows. Like I remember the first time I showed next to Hamish Mitchell. Like I was just like a wee starstruck. Like it was in the Scottish National when I was an intermediate. You could sheer up into the the National as an intermediate, and my heat gets called out, and I'm I'm sheering next to Hamish Mitchell, and I was buzzing. I'm like, get make sure and get a photo of me with the names next to yeah. each other on that. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite rare in sport to do that. Well, it, it, it won't be long before you want a photograph with, next to you. <laughs> that'll be handing him the camera, or maybe the, this time round. But didn't you make a a demo of sort of to, how to share demo? Have you done some of that work to help other people how to share? I mean, demonstrations on, on yeah, the sheep game. Yeah, we do a lot of sharing videos, and I, I do some shows. We go to some shows and do some sharing demos that the public absolutely love sharing. It's one of those things. If you've never seen a sheep shared and you're at one of these shows, you don't just wander by and go, "Oh, there's a guy shearing a sheep." You go. <gasps> There's a guy shearing a sheep, and you come, you, you walk over and watch it because it's it's such a like nobody really thinks about where they. I mean, most of them probably have a clue that's what happens, but nobody will ever have seen it up close. So, sure. um, so it draws a massive crowd. I did, at the Highland, I was at the Highland show this year. My wife and I had a few sheep there, and um, just remember going down and just going down to see Di. And, and I think um, Andrew Goldie was was commentating with me because they do the commentary there. And Andrew went down. He said he's going to do some commentary on the on the, on the sheep shear. And so I went down and have a look. And uh, those guys make it it's so exciting, and it really is. And when you see the crowd, they're all just up out their seats and and giving it loudly. It's like watching Strictly Come Dancing or something. They get they get really hyped up about it, don't they? Oh, it's fascinating, and it's going to be—it's going to be mental this year. I'm—I'm—I'm I'm, I'm a wee bit worried about how it's all going to work. If I'm honest, I just—I just think that the shearing is so. I mean, even the juniors, which is the, the bottom grade, uh, where they just shear two sheep in the heats, even that's mobbed with people wanting to watch. So, with the, having the world championships, it, it's just going to be insane. Like, I just wonder—it's already quite a busy week, you know yourself. It's a busy spot down there. Okay. I just wonder how the logistics will work out, but I, I believe in them. I believe in them. Well, and you have your own your own stand, and we'll go to that as well in a second with these sort of merchandise and that. You have your own stand at the uh, at the show, and hey, you'll be busy with that and, and your and your videos and, and the shearing and everything. Else. Just stick with the shearing. One more thing, I, I said I got a few sheep. I got some Rylands, and uh, they you can Beautiful. shear them if you want to, but <laughs> they're not much fun to shear. I don't think. Are they? But not like those bare ass texels anyway that you talk about when all the wool falls off the bloody thing. What's the what's the word? No, you'd need a few more than sixty seconds. For our island, that's for sure. <laughs> What's the worst sheep you want? You, you've had a go at then. What you, I've seen some videos of you just shearing monster tups and various things. What's the worst sheep? Oh, the, yeah, those those valley black nose, hands down. Oh, really? Um, and I th- to, to be fair, I think most people that shear them say, say the same thing. They just when, when you pull them out, various reasons. I mean, they have wool everywhere, right down in between their toes. <laughs> um, you know, all around the legs, right into the head and behind the horns. They just go limp on you as well. So it's pretty sore on your back. Usually, a sheep's quite. Yeah, you know, she's got a wee bit. Of, uh, she's a wee bit rigid and you can sort of lean into her at certain points of the shear and, and help ease your back these sheep just lie like like total petted like in the huff mm. and, and give you nothing back the other issue is they're very expensive and, <laughs> and the I wolves suppose the final fortune. issue <laughs> yeah it, well yeah it, the, the, and the, the final problem is and you know it is what it is but most people that own them generally speaking aren't farmers so you can, you can say what you like. Yard. They're all listening. But you can say what you like. It's your floor. You carry I, on. I'm not going to say. Well, anything. yeah, no. I, I know Raymond's been on here, but Raymond's a different man altogether. Right. I know Raymond's here. That totally diff- been on here. That's a different thing altogether. But like most that have got a wee handful, two or three or whatever, He'll admit like that, yeah. they'll stand over you, absolutely terrified. Mm. Uh, and then like, don't be wrong. I don't worry too much about it these days. Mm. But like, if you weren't an experienced shearer, the, the, the you know the, the 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 man or lady standing over top of you panicking about our sheep it just adds stress to the whole situation <laughs> makes it even worse it and then some of them have got no bloody no, no meat on them either i remember picking a couple of the welsh show we were down there and just going to see because raymond was judging down there and, and a couple of you lambs and you could pick one up in each hand they weighed about bloody 10 kilos a piece of no meat on them either and that's even harder you need a fat sheep don't you to shear them that's what you want is a bit of, bit of flesh on them that's it they don't sit as comfy if, if they're lean and again it is quite a problem you see with not i suppose not just valleys but valleys hide it well so these people you know that, that are buying them for pets don't actually realize how much work's involved in sheep no, no. And, and keeping them right and looking after their feet and you know keeping condition on them because you know sometimes i'd go to ones and shear them and you think this is skin and bones but because they've been off fluffy we will they think they're 
they're huge. <laughs> they get a bit um, of a surprise when when the fleece comes off and they've got a bloody something a hat rack stand stand in there. Yeah. Aye, aye, and you, you say when did they last get a fluke dose? And they say what's a fluke dose? <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye, aye. aye. Oh, well, those people do. Be fair, they they keep the wheels turning in the industry. We can't uh, we can't knock it. Listen, and I, all I don't want to take the piss out of, out of yep. people at the end of the day. Everybody keeps asking for different all. reasons, and and, uh, and they are all good for the industry that they bring the money outside money into into the world. Me too, me included. No, hundred percent. I've got six railings, so I'm hardly big. I've got I've got a few more Charolais as well. We've got six railings, so it's hardly hardly the big sheep farmer here. So I can't say too much. But I have been breeding sheep like you. I've been in the, involved in sheep since so I was a band. So. And and g- going on to the sheep game, a lot of this it, it's it is short videos though compared to to the podcast. You normally run with what five or six minute videos, unless it's a, a special one, is it, or, or or longer than that. Ah, uh, mix, mix it up. I, I generally want to try and keep them about ten minutes now because I do think people's tastes are changing that they like a bit shorter. It, it depends, you know, if, if there's merit in it, like the chance video, maybe a wee bit longer. If there's merit in keeping it longer, we'll do that. But generally speaking, we try and keep it quite short and snappy. It, it's just the way that uh, you know, some folk will you'll get comments complaining saying, "Oh, I'd love to watch just the whole thing as it happens and stuff." But then there's a lot of people just lose interest if it runs on too long well as you said mixing so it up I find mixing just, it up yeah that makes a difference yeah. yeah keeping a decent pace but showing enough um you know people just generally just want to see what you're what you're up to you know and it, like I, you know i'm that kind of way as well i like to just watch farming's what we love so we just we farm all day then watch videos of someone else farming <laughs> you're right but you do the commentary on that sometimes obviously if you're you're direct to camera and again this is other people probably wouldn't have thought about it but if you're working direct to camera you'll just literally shoot from the hip and 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 blather away as, as you go along whereas other times you'll take the take the i assume anyway you'll take the video and then you'll put the over you'll overdub the script on it afterwards i mean how how does that work for you when you're shooting from the hip it must be technically difficult yeah, I ramble a lot of nonsense a lot of time. There's a lot of cutting that goes on, cut, cut, cut. Uh, but the the voiceover's a great tool because you can explain things. You can show the images. The problem with the vlogging type is quite often, depending on the mic you're using or whatever, you need to be looking at the camera yeah. and speaking. But then if you're looking at the camera, all the people see is you. So I do try and make it more of show footage and then cut over it with some voiceover because it's far better. Very much like, well, you'll know the Hoof GP. Mm-hmm. You know he's he's made a fortune out of voicing over action shots and and, and generally I, sh- I should do more than that. I find the voice the voiceover quite difficult right enough because you you actually just about need to write a script for that, or you end up taking a million takes to try and say what you want to say. Right. Um, and, and get it right. I find it easier just to actually do it with the camera when I'm doing it. This is me. I'm, I'm going to overscript you now when you come come back. When this one goes live, I'll have rewritten all, all what I'm saying. No, I won't. But I did when I first started doing. <laughs> I did when I first started doing this. I did have a script, and I'd send people a script. So this is what I'm going to say, and they were kind of reading the script back. And the whole thing was so was so stale that you have to have the spontaneity. But that takes it takes courage and it takes experience, doesn't it? I was doing making a film last night, funnily enough, in in a, a distillery in uh, in, in five. And the guy there, real professional, and he's wandering around. We've got three cameras on there, and look at this camera, look at that camera. And you think, Chris, it gets, it gets big big business when you get up that level. But you're, you're a one man with a camera. You, most of it yourself, uh, Kimmy? Yeah, just a bit all of it. Um, there might be, I'm trying to think if there's, there's been the odd video I've had a hand, but not speaking, it's all just myself uh, that, that we film with. It's the, the, the vlogging thing, it's, I suppose it becomes for a, for a brand or that that's making a video, they have to be be sleek and professional and well done but when, when people get invested in you as such you don't have to be as 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 sleek and as professional they're just really coming to see you and what you're up to so you know and a lot of people like the rough and ready nature of it as well it makes it real doesn't so, it yeah yeah definitely i mean like i just not, not that i'm trying to drop this in in any way but i had a phone call with landlord the other day just talking about the next season coming up and um they'd said that one of their favorite well they said their favorite piece of the season that I had done was one where I went up in the hills gathering Herdwicks and I actually just took the GoPro myself mm-hmm. and, and filmed a lot of it myself with the GoPro and they just loved this, a fast pace, rough and ready action sort of nature of it. Um, and now I think they want to try and factor that into a few a few things going forward. That's brilliant. I mean, I, I was going to come on to Landwood, but you've mentioned it now. I mean, the, the two programs that I would turn on the TV to watch would be the Landwood and, of course, This Farm and Life, and, and both of which are, are, are excellent in different ways. But, I mean, you've been quite involved in Landwood now and is there more of that coming then as you said you're out there with a GoPro rather than the whole sound crew and for them it must be cheap filming compared to shipping half a dozen guys out there with a with a with an entire helicopter full of stuff so 
Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said they'd just be as well commissioning the sheep game yeah. uh, for a segment each week. That's right. Uh, but no, yeah, I, I, th- I think it's just going to be the odd one. We're going to try try these things and, and see how it works. The, they seem quite keen just to add that sort of dynamic into it, just for a bit of a lot of things in the BBC. They're always thinking about bringing in a how do you bring in the next generation of viewers and things like that. So they're all very positive. I, I'm quite. You know, I say this uh, quite openly to a lot of folk. I'm not used to the environment as such of, of working with um, like the landlord people, the people I work with in landlord. They're all so nice. Okay. And like a, as a farmer and former police officer, it makes me quite uneasy because every work environment I've been, you knew people liked you by how much they slagged you off. Yeah, you know, yeah. like like we're never really we're never really nice to each other. I'm never like, oh Andy, you're such a good guy, you know that, or you're you're, you're so good at what you do, you know. You don't you just slag each other off. Uh-huh, true. That's very, uh, that's um, very... Well, they're very complimentary, so I'm always like, am I going to get sacked next week? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know, like oh, you're doing great stuff and all that. Like you're doing you're doing a great, and I'm always like, hmm, like <laughs> it makes me so like if somebody in the police said that to me, it'd be full of sarcasm, but. Um, it is just genuine uh, being nice, so I, I'm just getting used to that. I, I would. I, I'm going to be a bit. Con- going to be a bit controversial and say that the BBC generally have seem to have a downer on agriculture, on livestock. Certainly in England, anyway, they seem to have a sort of tail wagging the dog. But a lot of the minority, uh, um, the minority sectors maybe get a, a a bigger part of the show. Would I be wrong on that? I mean, is is there is there parts of the BBC that that, that love agriculture? Is the whole agricultural department in the BBC that uh, that they really want to want to show us as we are rather than as the bad guys? Well, uh, what I would say is that BBC Scotland is a different business. It's oh, it's all the BBC, but it's run as a different business okay. than uh, uh, BBC the UK. So it's had uh, you know the BBC Scotland has its own commissioner that commissions its own shows. So Landlord's part of BBC Scotland. It goes out in that channel first, and then and then gets used in the wider BBC. Same. This farm and life's the same. Okay. Um, it's it's a BBC Scotland show. I think from from speaking to them, I think they are. Certainly, BBC Scotland's very pro farmer. I think the demographic here in Scotland, if you're going to appeal to m- certainly the majority, you would be shooting that way. I don't think you know. I, I do often wonder, and I, I genuinely have no, absolutely no issue. Like, there's not many things bother me at all, and, and the whole vegan thing doesn't bother me really. I, but I do wonder when I go into Greg's in Kilmarnock, which is a fairly working class town, how many people. Order a vegan sauce. I wonder. I just some days I want to just ask, how many vegan sausage rolls do you sell in Kilmarnock? Like, <laughs> can it be many? My wife went into the one in St Andrews. Other day she went into. I think it was Pizza Express. She said, "I said, do you want the vegan menu or the ordinary menu?" And I thought, well, it's the wrong way around, really." But that's St Andrews. I I understand. Hey, there's there's certain areas where obviously St Andrews still be that many vegans with the that the, imagine Kilmarnock. You're right. They wouldn't be selling too many of them. It's it's the geographical different. We're we're trading on hot coals here, uh, Cam. We probably need to walk away from. <laughs> <laughs> I take working class as an absolute compliment, by the way. That's me complimenting Come on, look. <laughs> and Let's go on. I mentioned uh, earlier on about you, you doing positive thinking and uh, you do some stuff for the RSAPI, of course, for the, the mental health and the whole keep talking thing. And I, I, I've... Uh, to work with Scotty Brown's done some of this, and, and and John Scott. There's a few good sort of advocates for that. We should be looking at the at the mental health thing. And you guys have just uh, down in Ayrshire, they have just raised twenty four thousand. Is that right? In 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 some dinner or something? That's uh, that's some 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 event. Yeah, I've got to give a shout um, to to David Cooper who organised all that. He, he, some amount of work went into it. Like it was a fantastic night. Tremendous auction lots. That you know that's what that raised the money. You know you had a four ball at Royal Troon and 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 various sort of high end prizes and, and you know, a lot of fantastic local businesses were chipping in and digging deep to to support the cause. So yeah, that's a lot of money to you know that'll be that pay a member of staff for well, just about pay a member of staff for for a year. Like it, it does make a big I just think it's such a fantastic thing, R S A B I uh-huh. and I just wonder that yeah, okay, it's 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 probably get more awareness now and it's more visual thanks to social media and various other things. But I just wonder how many you know farmers We'll, we'll sit there, you know, in a bad place, and and, and still not pick up the phone. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's just I think myself lucky that I don't understand depression because I've never been in that spot to understand it. Mm-hmm. So, so I can't really imagine what it's like uh, to not be able to get yourself out of rut. But like, I'd I'd hope that you know, anybody listening to this, this this time of year is, you know, this is the peak time for for these feelings. Mm. Give them a phone. You're just talking to a, you're talking to a stranger. Yeah. Like, what have you got to lose? Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, it is, and he, I'd like to think you and I do our bit. I know it was somebody said you know, during COVID that when I came out with a podcast, they said, you know, you, you're actually, you could be saving lives by this, or people getting to somebody, a voice to listen to something they're interested in or something just sort of keep them going and upbeat, and, and, and you so more than me because you've got a, you know, a hell of a lot more more people that watch you on there, but you do everything with a smile on your face, and I think that, you know, again, that uh, that does bring a lot of goodness into into the into the thing. What were you auctioning then? Did you auction a day shearing for yourself and a day scanning? And <laughs> you get in, were, you doing the, were you doing the selling? Were you the auctioning? Auctioneer, I can imagine you auctioneer. No, Drew Drew Kennedy Air did the okay. selling actually, he did very well. Um I, I auctioned off what did we, we auctioned off we've got a new sort of embroidery business that we're doing now off the back of the sheep game. So I auctioned off a a list of workwear stuff. So that went for nine hundred quid, which is very good. I shout to TH Jenkinson for buying that one. So okay. we'll uh we'll, we'll 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 do a bit with them. But yeah, this is just another crazy thing that's came off the back of the Let's, social media let's just go into that a little bit because I was going to talk to you before Christmas and as I said earlier on you had the you have the stand at the at the Highland show and and uh, you're selling your merchandise and just a shearing vest now and hey, if you're not if you're not shearing wearing a sheep game shearing vest you're just not dressed right is it? <laughs> you really have start, you've started yeah. a fashion that I'm sure you never never saw coming around the corner and I think that's doing well for you Oh, that is the biggest part of our business now, right. by 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 miles. I mean, we now, oh, it's been, like, honestly, Christmas was insane. Um, I could never have imagined it going the way it's it's went, and I, I I take that as the people, you know, the farming community and stuff. There, we are showing support. Don't be wrong. I, I stand by. The, I think the stuff we sell, you know, I try and make sure it's all good stuff. And and like, I mean, I wear it every day, mm. um, and it's all reasonably priced compared to other people doing something similar. But like, I see it as them supporting me and saying you know what you and lizzie and, and the families are doing you know good on you we'll support you we'll buy this jumper or, or buy this piece of merchandise and, and i do appreciate it and yeah i mean we've now got a guy employed full-time yeah, um yeah. And, and two part-time staff to run this this offshoot of it which is now this embroidery business okay um, yeah. doing other people's stuff as well the sheep game sort of the base order to, to pay the wages and then there's the scope there to grow it, and that's what this this new guy's in for. Okay, well, I mean, I know that I was involved in that when I I, I ran a livestock supplies business. Bloody, I would say before you're born, Cammy, but we're not quite. But certainly a long time ago, and we used to get embroidered. We started bringing in embroidered jackets and show show grooming stuff and that, and that was sort of the start of it, going back a long time. But what I used to have a guy who did the embroidery for us, and. Uh, um, he was fairly hefty on the charging and then he t- said do you realize how much these machines actually cost and I didn't and uh, if you've bought one of those and put it in, in yourself then that's a big investment yeah you, you can blame or blame rural finance for that one I had uh, I had issues with supply basically we were selling so much stuff last Christmas not the Christmas there but the Christmas before we were selling so much stuff that the people we were getting our embroidered stuff from just couldn't keep up uh-huh. and the waiting times were huge and we were just missing a lot of opportunity so uh, I phoned up, I phoned up a company that sells embroidery machines down in England, and they had a, a big six header machine that uh, does six things at a time. Second hand, it was twenty five thousand uh, pounds. I didn't have twenty five thousand pounds, so I thought let's phone Rural Finance. So uh, good old Dan Anderson over there that the uh, Rural Finance sorted me out with the. Uh, with the finance for it, and next thing, this thing was arriving, and we got a, a unit rented out over at uh, Stewarton, and and we work out of there now, and we've just uh, signed a, a lease for a, a second unit right next to it now. Well, okay, um, to, to and that side of things. Brilliant, is, that, yeah, that's fantastic story. As I said, a, a spin-off really that you probably didn't see coming around the corner. It used to be um, Horner. Horner, oh Horner, yeah, of course, Wally Horner. Everybody Aye. wore a Horner, Wally Horner, a, a, yeah, yeah, a Horner vest, and now everybody wears a sheep game vest. I mean, you, you you've done that. Yeah, he, and that well, that's brought you success, and that's fantastic. But you will make money. Again, I'm not going to ask you figures, but you'll make money off your more than I do off my podcast. You'll make money off your uh, off your YouTube channel as well. I think there is a, a revenue stream comes out of that, doesn't? It, yeah, I mean, I never mind. I, honestly, I don't mind talking. For, I always found that was one of the difficult things when I was coming into farmers. Nobody would talk figures with you. Every look, like the the farmer would pull up and he's a. Uh, Thirty thousand pound pickup and lean out the window and going, "Wait, what? Getting the farming for? There's no money in it." And then drive off, and it's like, "Ah, it looks that way." <laughs> <laughs> but nobody, it's like I always made a joke John, when things were bad there, um, when the feed prices and stuff were all gone up. Uh, I, I was speaking to a dairy farmer, and he says to me, "Oh, my, he says my feed bill was, uh, my feed bill was X amount this month. Say my feed bill was five thousand pound this week." 
I said, oh, what was your milk check? Oh, that's not the point. That's not the point. It's like, well, don't tell me the feedback and don't tell me the milk check. Um, so, no, I don't mind the figures. I, I, I'll, I think this last year on YouTube, I'm actually going to make a video. I have a wee other thing that I do videos on, and I might make a video for that. But I think YouTube won't be as crazy as folk think. I think it'll be somewhere in the region of £15,000, okay. maybe slightly more. I would need to sit down and look at it. But somewhere between fifteen and £20,000. Okay. Um, from YouTube, which sounds sounds fantastic. Um, it is fantastic. Hey, hey, and you don't have. I have a main sponsor, Harbro. Thank you, Harbro, for your sponsorship. And uh, and uh, no, you're not Nick and I'm coming. Um, they, you don't have a. No, main, no, well done, Harbro. <laughs> you don't have a main uh, a main sponsor there. That all comes directly from advertising. Them putting adverts in in the middle of that. But hey, that fifteen grand sounds fantastic. But it's like somebody saying I earn fifteen grand in farming when you do seventy hours a week. If you took it, if you took it hour by hour, you probably it probably isn't a, probably isn't a minimum wage coming. But that's commendable. Oh no no, uh, yeah yeah no. If you were to actually work out there, was you put in? I would, I would. I would it, it might be as as, as the followers going. I might be getting there now that it's it's not the same, but it's it's quite a. You know, I will. There's there's peaks and troughs. There's times I I do suffer from what you probably, probably call burnout. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm if I'm perfectly honest, I'm probably in that little lull just now a little bit. Okay. Um, where a combination of, you know, we talked about the sheep scan there, like, mm-hmm. a combination of sitting at the sheep scanner all day, cold, wet, miserable days, you know, some rough night's sleep. Not as rough as Lizzie's having it, but, you know, I still I still hear the, the new one uh, when he's shouting for a feed. Yeah. So broken night's sleep, early mornings, long days scanning, coming home at night. The thought of sitting down and doing four or five hours on a video, it's like... <sighs> bad enough, don't yeah. and then, Bad enough having to chat to me, for guys sake. <laughs> no, but, you know, I enjoy this. Crap. No, I, I honestly do enjoy these things. I do. I love I love getting these things. Because it is, it's like a type of therapy as well. Like, even for me, just speaking the things out loud. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I've not I've no said to anybody that I'm feeling like I've got a bit of burnout just now and that it's, you know, it's pretty heavy going. There. So it gets it off your chest sure. and, you know, you feel you feel refreshed. Sure, that's good. So these things are good. Good, and that's, good. again, good wise words for folks to do that. As you said, pick up pick up the phone. And we just go back to the sheep to the sheep game you've got now, sort of snazzy graphics and, and uh, you know, and, and you put some music on there and what have you. I mean, there's a hell of a work to do that, but the sheep game is actually a brand. It's, it's almost a, in itself, would it be a, um, an asset? Is it a saleable asset? Have you, have you built it up into something that's uh, that, that's tangible? <laughs> It, that, that's a good somebody's talking to me about that the other day they, they probably the issue uh, I mean I think it's a, yeah I think we've somehow we've struck very lucky when I first started it I thought when I, when I did the logo I think I thought every great logo is extremely simple so Nike uh, Facebook it's just the word Facebook mm-hmm. all these uh, best logos I think are, are really simple so I thought was simple cartoon sheep mm-hmm. draw a cartoon sheep and then um I did it and I thought, oh, that's just nothing. And I was like, let's make it red. I just thought, we'll make it really stand out and, and be different from anything else. I thought, we'll make it red because wh- why would you have a red sheep? It doesn't make any sense. So I thought nobody else would have a red sheep because it, you know, why, why would you? It's, it's, it's just stupid. Which is, so which is so why, we made it red. That's why you got a call from one of, one of somebody the other day because when I said on Wednesday that uh, my guest is a little bit running a bit late this week and all I put was your logo on there and everybody's been pinging you. So it's certainly working. They know, they know it is the red sheep. Oh, that's certain. Like, if you're at an auction, like I'll know. I'm sure most people, but I would notice straight across the ring if I see that logo in somebody's chest or in a hat. I just know it's my logo. Um, just just the way we've done it. So no, we got very lucky with that. Very lucky with the name. A, a lot of people will name their YouTube channel after their own name, um, which really limits you because you know with the sheep game, anybody that likes sheep, you don't have to like me. Just anybody that likes sheep, it's a great option for a gift for your. You know, where do you get the old shepherd? You, you know your father that's an old shepherd and he's miserable and doesn't want any gifts would you get him a get him a get him a sheep game bonnet you know yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> i you know so th- there's definitely the element of that there's I, I would say by the amount of merch we sell there's definitely more merch sold going into people that just like sheep than people who probably actually follow the sheep game but, but the one, religiously the one, if you know what the I mean. one promotes the other doesn't it i mean it, it, people will see the sheep game is the same totally same with the top lines of tales i was at a I was at a distillery a, a, a book signing yesterday, and I got chatting to, to someone. He said he's a farmer, and I said, "I said, top, oh, I, I know about Top Lines and Tales podcast." And you think, well, yeah, it's different walks of life that people people walk into that. But as you said, that, yeah, that people will see that, and and uh, and it brings one brings you more listen. It's a recursive circle, really, isn't it? That uh, the one brings the other one in. Yeah, oh, totally. And you know, I, and I, as I said, I do think a big part of it is the fact that people are. Um, very kindly getting behind us and, and supporting us. I mean, we're. I, mean, I, I don't. I say it quite often. Like the goal is to to buy a farm, but you know what I was doing before when I was just 
I'm running. Well, I still am running sheep on rented ground. I'm never going to buy a farm mm. doing that. No, like no. even if I'm shearing twenty thousand sheep in a summer, it's you know the rents that I'm paying, and then your cost. Of, you're just keeping you, you know, paying your your rent in the house and all your other expenses. Mm. Um, you, you're never going to save up enough to buy. For, so you need to try and multiple income streams is what I'm sure. shooting for now. And that with your scanning as well, mm-hmm. of course, yeah, as you said, you do have four or five different income streams coming in, but there's only so much of you. You weigh yourself too thin, as you said, at you know, the time of year when you, you do get a bit burnt out and you can, so you've got to work out where the, where the, the profit is really. And obviously that sounds like that the, 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 the merch side of that is the one that's, that's doing, doing good. Um, just kind of move on a little bit. Time's going on there. The recent video you just did was about putting rams out onto an island by boat, which is fantastic. Achievements, I think, not blackies, which is, I found interesting. But that's a lot of that's filmed from the drone. Is that you as well? Is that, is that you, you fly one of those things? Yeah. So I'm messing about every camera I made. Don't get me wrong. One of the cameras was a, one of the guys was holding a GoPro for a bit. I just said, here, you just switch the GoPro and say, hold that and, and do your best to get some shots. Um, but yeah, I, I do all the drone uh, flying um, as well. But I'd just like to clarify that Chivate and Blackie thing. I maybe didn't quite work. Well, I, I did word it right, but people wouldn't pick up on the wording of what I said because I saw the North Country Chivate page sharing it and almost as if I was saying that the Chivate was harder than the Blackie. That's actually not the reason that they're now using Chivates. The reason they're using Chivates is the Chivates don't wander uh, they don't uh, rate. We would say rake. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. the, the the word that would be used there, but they don't rake the same as as the blackies do. So what the blackies were doing is they were jumping on a wee outcrop of rock to eat some grass, and then being like, "Oh, I can't get off of here." <laughs> so so then they were just staying there and that until they died, they starved and they they died and they fell off. Whereas they find the cheviots d- don't do that as much. Right. That's... They, they must just be. Uh, just quite a strange thing, like, but I should really explain that more because it is interesting. Well, I thought and, it was an interesting it, swing because you just assume all those hills that they're blackies, blackies, and having done a podcast on the Chiviots recently and, and realising the merit of those, and they are taking a little bit of ground off the blackies, but I didn't really think out in the island, so that was uh, that was interesting. So that's clarified that a little bit. Yeah, well, just I saw some of the comments and, so, you know, like North Country Chiviots getting right behind it, which is fine, you know, good on them. But uh, I just thought, um, if you listen to my wording, you know, I'm more pointing to the fact that they don't wander away the same and get into danger mm-hmm. as opposed to being actually any harder because I would not, being a, you know, the sheep game is, is uh, breed neutral, I should say. Um, so I don't... <laughs> other sheep are available. Say, I have other breeds are available. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I have Chivates and I have Blackies, and you know they they are what they are. They have the reach of their own merits. Uh, you're not advocating the Ryland. No. We'll see if we can get. A, I'll see if I can get a, a red Ryland. See if I can paint one red and get a bit of, well, bit of sponsorship do, from you. Do, do you know where I advocate the Ryland? Actually, people ask me what's a good sheep to get, and I'll often say the Ryland because it's small, easy to work with, kind nature, uh, nice fleshed, easy lambing. It, you know, it's, it's, it's a good sheep starter sheep. That's true. Very true, actually. They are, and they, they're docile as anything. A lot of youngsters going into these Black Rylands now, and it is, yeah, they're getting as, as a start sheep, starter sheep, and that's uh, and that's fine. So it's uh, edit that back. <laughs> Just talking about overseas, though, though Cammy, you, you will have a lot of listeners. I mean, what percentage? Oh, I've got a lot of listeners overseas as well. What sort of percentage of your listeners will be out with the country, out with the UK? Or your watchers, should I say? Well, before... Uh, that that video that got 100 it's fairly skewed it because it is now all in, well india is the biggest user of youtube in the world okay. i believe um that, that is the biggest base for, for so so india is massively it, it now goes something like india indonesia russia i think is like third um they must must like sheep over there <laughs> but previous to that before that video went crazy it was maybe 40 odd percent was the uk 30 percent was uh, over to the states, ten percent in Ireland, and then the rest was split. Um, else, Canada was fourth, I think. So that was the kind of main ones. It's about where um, I am, the same with before that. Ma- ma- are you a similar split? Are you? How many? How, do you? How many listeners do you get on a regular basis? Uh, we, I was quite interested to know. We that. get over a thousand a week. Over a thousand a week. So I'm not in your in your aye, aye, not aye. in your game anyway. No, I mean, but, hey, hey, but who knows? We might get a few more when you're on here this week. But sometimes yeah, we'll get there. But it, it, it works itself out to sort of five six thousand a month. So it's not. And we, we've grown and then sort of stayed fairly. That's no, tremendous. Fairly static, but it's it's quite a special. A little bit more niche than yours as well. As people got to listen for forty minutes from me droning on to to people as well. So it's not quite as so exciting. Ah, oh, but yeah, no, but anybody you know even you know the interesting things you cover but one great thing with you that are certainly an advantage you have over me is the fact that being from Ayrshire I like I, you know I'm even just now I'm putting quite an effort into speaking in a way that you know the Australian listeners and the American will be able to understand what I'm saying <laughs> um, and 
I'll quite often watch a video back and if I've just lost concentration for a minute, I've just totally slipped into Scots. <laughs> and it's like, you know, my, all, when I first started uh, getting a bit more reach, all my comments were, what language is he speaking? <laughs> what language is he speaking? Um, and then I went through a phase of, yeah, I went through a phase of typing subtitles to every video <laughs> and it's just the time that takes is just mental. The, the, so that stopped quickly. The only one I could compare um, that to is, uh, is you know, James Alexander and um, Jay Lex. James, if you're listening, hello. Um, Jay, listen, I had him on and he phoned me. And get a busy guy like yourself, always ducking, diving, busy, busy, busy. And eventually phoned me a Saturday night one night when, and uh, I'd been at a party or something and I was well pissed and he phoned me and I thought, well, go on, we'll take this. We'll do this recording right now. <laughs> so James is on there blathering away and I'm on there blathering away. The next day, I I could edit myself all the questions back in again and make myself sober again, but I couldn't edit James anymore. So, and I couldn't subtitle it either. So, uh, yes, you're, you're right. There are some, sometimes it is quite to, it's quite hard. Hey, I've got a guy in the States that says that sometimes. What, what language is that guy speaking? But, hey, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, we are who we are. We are who we are. And, and you, yeah, well, that's it. That's it. And I do, I, I do, I do make a real effort on the video because the only way I'm going to get, Again, I'm I'm very friendly with the Hoof GP, and he gives me lots of advice. And the only way you're going to grow your thing, especially in the world of YouTube, is to really attract that the American audience, because that is obviously a massive part of YouTube, and and a lot of the ad revenue is aimed at. You know, a lot of big business in America use YouTube for ads. So to do that, you need to speak a bit slower, a bit clearer. You know, pronounce your words in, uh, correctly. Uh, you know yourself, you're a very fast... You're oh, yeah. Quite interesting, actually, when I listen to you, because you're a very fast speaker, but you're very clear, um, which is quite a rare thing in Scotland. I think you'll agree. Um, My so, wife won't say I'm pretty clear. I'm going to show you. She can't understand clear. the word I say. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just selective hearing. <laughs> that's a good skill, that. And, 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 and you'll, yeah. pal, you'll be pally, I yeah. guess, with Jim Smith, and I can imagine Jim Smith doing a world tour in the USA and just seeing if anybody actually can understand him saying hello, let alone anything else. Aye, Jim's good. The the Chukter, no. the Chukter, uh, thing he, thing he does for his act is good. Like, have you had Jim on the podcast? No, I haven't. No, no. We'll we'll chase him down one he, of the he, days. I think he'd be he'd be entertaining. Like, ah, he's a he's a great guy. He's he's been good to me. Like, he's he's a great laugh. So he's done really well for himself. I mean, he has he's he's done a lot of it with without like I've used social media t- to do it, but he's you know he's got what he's got. All right, he does a little bit of social media. It's a few viral videos to be fair, but you know he's done it. Uh, maybe the old-fashioned way getting off his ass and going of, uh, of grafting yeah. the comedy scene and, sure. and yeah. exactly and getting on like Scott Squad, which is a big job, and he's got his own show, The Farm. Oh. Um, yeah, he's some man, and he is just a farmer. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. No, he's done a, he's great. done a lot for farming. Has a few of them. We won't even go to Clarkson at the moment because he's about he's, he's, he's bad news. But uh, yeah, there's a few out there, and and um, just well, hey, there's 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 <laughs> a, no, it's a it's a good uh, like I I. I was speaking to someone about this other day, and uh, the, I, I see Amazon. I don't know if that's confirmed. I don't think. I think if Amazon get the views, we'll take them on again. Mm-hmm. It's maybe just a bit of stirring up, but yeah, it did. It definitely put his foot in it. But I, I must say, when I first read it, I instantly thought of the the Game of Thrones scene, mm-hmm. and and I, I got the reference. He's just not mentioned the Game of Thrones as he's big. But actually, what upset me about the whole thing is the fact he's using the word hate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like I just, I like. You hate somebody that you've never even really met or anything to do with. Like it's such a yeah. bad attitude. It is. I think that that was my thoughts on it. No, first, no, anyway, no, I'll agree with that. I'll agree. With that. And then, and anyway, we'll move on. You, you do. You get out to the shows in in the summer. You were filming at the Yorkshire show, I think. We won the breed champion at the at the Yorkshire show, and you were out there in. You were out there, I think, filming Interbreed, and I was out there, and I don't think you ever, that video ever came to light. So if you ever get any footage of that one, I'll have it back. Thanks. But uh, I did a I did a live podcast. No, I don't. Do a, yeah, do a few of those as well. Yeah, I saw you'd done, I've not got to those either, I saw you'd done some lives at the, the Yorkshire show. No, yeah, I, I, I just need to be, it's a difficult one because I had these grand plans to make videos of different things at shows, but the issue I have is really, I, I kind of need to be on the stand all the time because people are coming to meet and greet and, and talk to you. And when you're wandering about through the show, you, you can hardly take two steps, which is a great thing and it's not a complaint at all, but you can hardly take two steps while you're videoing without someone saying, can I get a picture or, you know, coming to speak to you. And I just found it impossible to vlog at, at the shows at the Highland. Sh- there was no vlogs from the Highland show this year. Um, and the Yorks are saying there's just the odd bit I put on Facebook. And well, we did a bit with Lizzie with the sharing, but, but that was it. And yeah, I just found, but it's, it's surreal to me because we've had COVID. So I've basically built this channel up over COVID. Yeah, yeah. So the following was growing quite big, but you never saw anyone because you, 
you weren't out anywhere. And then since it's all come back to normal at the shows this year, it was just surreal. It was just, yeah, insane. Yeah, first time for us back to the shows as well. And you're right. And, and, and it said you and I both sort of built up through the COVID times and, and a, change in, a change in the industry. And, and I will, we're getting towards the hour there. I will just... Uh, Mention something else, a change in the industry. I don't know if you listened to last week, you spoke to, uh, we spoke to Graham Gilmore in, in Australia and they've developed a new, a new breed of sheep that, that's not only self-shearing, but is high, cream, high premium quality. How do you see the self-shearing sheep working itself out into, into the Scottish hills? I think if, I'm not sure about Scottish hills as such, but I think if I had my own, like that, by the way, if anyone hasn't listened to that podcast, I'm unbelievable. Like just, Oh, just we there's a lot of things we do well here in this country I think um, and there's a lot of things we don't like we're still very old fashioned I think with the breeding of sheep is my opinion even me myself working away with like scotch mules bred you know and you know well not that I buy any fancy ones but you know even I go to those scotch mule sales and like you know these they're buying them because I've got a dark face to then put them to a texel top I don't knock the Scottish mule as one of the best, one of the best sheep in the world, and very, very suited to what it does here, and and, and a and a fantastic credit to our industry. Oh. You're right, but there is there's a lot of guys that have uh, passed the Scottish mule and gone a long, a long way further. Yeah, but then some of them have gone a bit crazy. I mean, listen, I love the mule. That's just about my whole flock is is mules. Um, we've always had the mule. I absolutely love the mule. She's oh, I'd, I'd go as far as say it's my favourite breed. But just listening to him and and just the traits you're selecting for and, and just the just the fact the recording thing. I tell you I was recently I don't have you ever been to Iceland? No, I haven't. I gather you were there shearing, were you? That had to be a cold no. day. Or maybe it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, well plenty of beer and a nice insulated shed. It wasn't too bad. But I went there with these preconceptions of uh, the Icelandic sheep we have here in the UK, which, you know, okay, that's that, that's that but they are they're just a smaller kind of you know, I'm thinking this kind of Shetlandy type mm-hmm. thing. But the sheep there are un- honestly I, there's no breed I've seen that I've thought I want to get pure a pure version of these and breed a wee flock. Okay. None of them interest me because most of them are getting fed or they're lambing. Like, I like Jacobs, mm. but the, the, the lambing December mm-hmm. is just a nonsense to sure. me. This is my, I'm going to upset some people that listen to this, but, like, why are we lambing a kind of hard day breed like that in December? Uh, anyway, I'm going to upset people. Go for it. But all these things just either they don't, they don't suit me. I, they don't suit me. I just don't. I like all the, like, I've got Jacobs as well. I like them. As I say, I would have them, but. To, to be competitive and be involved, you need to be lambing the same. I, I, I've no interest in that. I don't have a shed for a start. So um, I went and saw these. I, everything is recorded with these Icelandic sheep. The guys keep fairly tight flocks of about 600, most of them. So, you know, the, everything's kept pure. Every sheep in Iceland is an Icelandic sheep. Okay. Um, that, that They're all kept pure. You get coloured ones and you get the, the white ones. They're bred for genetics. There's, there's Icelandic sheep over there. They'll scan most of them are scanned about two hundred percent just off of uh, grass, and you know lambs are killing out at fantastic you know twenty odd kilos. Mm-hmm. Uh, the back ends on them. There's, there's, some of those Icelandic sheep have got asses like big shows. Really? Okay. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. They're nothing like the sheep here. Nothing like them. I, I couldn't get over it. How brilliant they were. Icelandic um, Beltex. Okay, and, there's, and there's, a, there's a podcast for me. I'll be needing to give them a call. I'll get I'll get some details off you. We'll give one of them guys a shout and get a look. I mean, they do crazy things. Like, I mean, I didn't realize um, uh, Medavisna is an Icelandic word. Okay. Um. So, like, it it's, it started over there. A big outbreak over there. I think they say it was in the eighties, and they've just since then they've been ridiculously strict huh. with their their animal health okay. uh, status. Huh. Um, so yeah, it's it's fascinating stuff. So that's, that's that's maybe a podcast for the future. Interesting. And the animal health thing is something I, I won't get into it now because we're kind of running on time. But the animal health thing again over over with us is starting to become an issue. I think more and more things we're looking at, but the more intense we, we do farm these things, and the more you got to look at animals that can can survive the the various outbreaks of things that we get going on. And I think we'll see a bit more of that coming on. Yeah, I mean, I think like I, I listened to a bit of um, Michael Blanche as well. Uh, a pasture pod. I think he did a podcast with Graham Lofthouse. Yeah. I'm dropping names here, but I might be getting the names wrong. Um, who who's breeding? He reminded me very much of the chap uh, Graham that you spoke. The other Graham you spoke to in Australia uh, of his, you know, breeding for a certain thing that he's aiming for. And I, I mean, most of our problem with sheep comes from the bull. You know, in the summertime, all your big stresses, your fly strike, you're stuck in their back, you know, getting the shearer in, and then, you know, maybe on a spot your shearer's not very good, and the sheep's got loads of cuts or whatever, and it's just a stressful day, you get the wool shedding sheep. Like, I, I, honestly, I think there's a big future. The other problem is, quite often I should be like an advocate for wool, and I get that, and I, I fully appreciate what an amazing thing wool is, but... 
nobody breeds for Will here. Like, we all kick up a fuss about, you know, everyone kicks up a fuss about, I'm getting so controversial here. <laughs> everyone, it's great, these podcasts, I can just run on there, I'll go back to the shame and I'll be totally neutral. I'll let it there, you'll be fine. I'll, uh, some of it, not all of uh, mine, I'll leave you, I'll leave you uh, high and dry, I'll hang it to dry. Aye, 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 don't be too controversial. <laughs> but, like, like every, you know, a lot of you know, people get upset about their will, mm-hmm. but when you ask them, when was the last time you bought a ram uh, to improve the wool quality of your sheep? They'll never have done it. You know, and, and wool is, unfortunately, now this byproduct of, of you know, producing meat um, that that just doesn't have it, and it's it's never going to come back to where it is, what, especially with the, the the energy costs this year. One time there was, yeah, there were breeds that you would keep for wool. I mean, the Rylands are a wool sheep, but originally, and you know, the Lincolns and all these things, and they still do have a class. I think it's at the yeah. Yorkshire Show where they have a class for the. The, the the best wool of the island, and you think, well, the good stuff. Maybe there is a market for that. Same as there is a merino. We'll all we'll all wear a merino jumper, or, or I suppose cashmere is a goat, isn't it? But yeah, but again, merinos are selecting rams for wool quality. You know, they're 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 breeding to have the best wool because it is worth so much money. So that's a different thing. Alto- you know, the merino wool is is just different class altogether. All and I thought uh, Graham uh, Aussie Graham made a, a great point about you know lack of shearers is the biggest issue in Australia just now if you take the money side of things out, like the, the massive shortage. And that's probably going to be, I'm not saying it's going to be the same issue in the UK, but it could be a factor moving forward because there's less and less people who want to work that hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, I don't blame, honestly, I do not blame anyone who's tried shearing and doesn't want to do it. I, I fully understand it. I, I do not, um, I don't blame anyone for saying that's not for me because it, it, it's a horrific thing. Um, it's just that I happen to get the bug for it. I think that's taken us full circle, Cammy. That's perfect. I think that's where we came in. There, you saying that you got the bug for shearing, and uh, it's got you to where Beautiful. you are, and, and how extremely successful that uh, that you've been as well. And I and, know uh, that's brilliant. And I gather you had the wee Ben born. Was it about Christmas time? I think. Um, so that's keeping you up at night as well. Yeah. Ah, yeah. It's, it's affecting us. Uh, Angus, we named him. He's uh, yeah, born on Christmas that's Day, right. which you know I was laughing. It's it's a, it's a dream for a social media influencer for getting the likes and the the, the, the comments. A Christmas Day baby, you can't beat yeah, it. Absolutely. Absolutely, and the birthing pool I thought was rather funny as well. There, we had a bit of a giggle over that one. <laughs> Aye, we're always looking for an angle for a laugh. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. And well, um, Cammy, it's been fantastic to speak to you. I know we missed out last week, but I hope a few people have, have enjoyed waiting and listening to this one. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And Cammy, it's been fantastic to speak to you and fantastic success with the with the sheep game. And anybody wants to know where to find the sheep game, I think you just enter the sheep game on online, and uh, you'll find you in all sorts of places. But uh, YouTube is 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 generally where you're at and uh, how many videos have, have you got in, in the can now, now uh, um, Cammy, for them to look at? Oh, there'll be 200 on there if you want to go right back to the, the one with me feeding the sheep with a buzz cut <laughs> and the monotone voice and yep, you'll get me Brilliant. there. Brilliant, and I think there's a there's a hundred, uh, 115, I think, uh, um, Top Lines and Tales podcast as well, so anybody new to this, uh, you're going to get uh, get plenty of entertainment through the rest of the year. Cammy, thanks very much for your time, it's been superb. Dear gentlemen, Andy, thank you. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this week's Top Lines and Tales podcast. And as always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Harbour, for their continued support. And and don't forget, it's now pedigree lambing is getting underway. We're getting into spring. And uh, Harbour's foundation was, of course, in the pedigree sheep business and pedigree sheep feed specifically. So they really do know what they're talking about when it comes to looking after those precious lambs. So why not give Harbour a shout and uh, see what they can do in the way of feed and minerals and all those things to, to save those precious lambs and look after those sheep while they're being housed in these in these winter conditions. And uh, find them on on social media and various other places uh, online or contact your local representative. And uh, don't forget, if you are online, uh, to look at our Top Lines and Tales Facebook page where you'll find some photographs and, and even some links to, uh, to the sheep game uh, videos you can have a look at there and some pictures about Cammy and, and, and all the other things that go alongside the Top Lines and Tales ethos. Uh, thanks again for, for listening in.